will Spain shift to the right? Its socialist prime minister faces serious challenges in early elections. His party has lost in regional polls. So will Pedro Sanchez be able to maintain power? And how is this being watched across the rest of Europe? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Sahil Rahman. Spain is heading to the polls. The socialists under Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez are facing off against the centre-right People's Party under Alberto Núñez Feijó. But it's the influence of smaller parties that could prove decisive. Either the far left or the far right are near certain to be part of a coalition government. It's part of a trend that's repeating itself across Europe. Now, we'll get to our guests in a moment, but first, this report from Fintan Monaghan. The leader of Spain's opposition senses opportunity. A disastrous showing by the government in local elections in May has painted a path for Alberto Núñez Feo of the centre-right People's Party to become the next prime minister. As the nation heads towards national polls, he believes momentum is on his side. No oculta lo ocurrido en el día de ayer. Calling snap elections doesn't hide what happened. Spaniards have said enough. We had enough. I think and value that this feeling is translated into a clear People's Party victory. Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez, a socialist of the centre-left, has made one of the biggest gambles of his political career. By calling snap elections, he's hoping to gain a new mandate. But more than five years in power have seen his popularity wane. High unemployment of more than 13% is a major concern among voters. His agenda on social issues like transgender rights has also divided opinion. And to pass legislation, he's had to rely on support from politicians from the rest of Basque and Catalan regions. That's allowed opponents to paint him as an ally of separatists. If Sanchez is to remain in power, he'll likely need to enter a coalition with Yolanda Diaz. She leads an alliance of parties on the far left. The far right also have a role to play. The Vox Party under Santiago Abascal is poised to be an essential coalition partner for a People's Party government. At a televised debate, Sanchez said the choice was clear. There are only two formations or two ways to govern. A government of the Progressive Coalition of the Socialist Party with the party of Yolanda Diaz or a government of the Vox Party. And I'm not afraid to say so. If I can, I'll govern with Mrs. Diaz. It's clear that we are two different organizations. Where large parties at the center once dominated, movements on the fringes are becoming difficult to ignore, a pattern repeating across Europe. The results of Spain's election may provide further signs of where the continent is headed. Vinton Monaghan for Inside Story. Well, let's bring in our guests for this edition of Inside Story in Madrid, Jose Maria Benito, president at the Governance and Society Institute in Berlin. Emily Schulteis, a former fellow at the Institute of Current World Affairs, who specializes in the rise of populist far-right parties in Europe. And in London, Pablo Calderon Martinez, Associate Professor of Politics and International Relations at Northeastern University. A very warm welcome to all of my guests on this edition of Inside Story. Jose, can I begin with you in Madrid? Uh, why would Pedro Sanchez bring forward early elections so soon after municipal defeats? I mean, time is a great healer. He could have stretched this out to reassure the public in Spain until at least December in that he is the leader to trust, but he hasn't gone for that option. Why? Well, I think this puzzles everybody still, and uh, also many people in his own party. Probably he was fearing that some of the opposition within his own party could stand up and eventually uh, become alternatives to his own uh, candidacy. This, that was one point. The second, also, he expected to... Uh, you know, take the advantage of the quick decision and have the opposition not prepared for the election. And third, he wanted also from uh, the government, as he has done, to recreate the left, the extreme left, 
but through a personality, through a politician, Yolanda Diaz, who uh, he has really brought into the uh, into the scene, and this was his third reason. OK, let's, uh, let's ask the same question, really, to Pablo Martinez. Is it, it, same question, really, but is it a real gamble for Sanchez? Uh, uh, yes, I think to an extent it's, it's a gamble. Uh, I think it's a calculated gamble. And I think whatever we think of Pedro Sanchez, I think he's proven himself to be a canny political operator over the last few years. Uh, and we'll see what happens. I think I agree with Jose Maria in, in, in a lot of his analysis. But I also think it's a calculated gamble because I think Pedro Sanchez could have easily predicted that uh, time can be a great healer, but in government, particularly a government that's been in, imposed for a good number of years, uh, the wear and tear of governing starts to make take effect. So I, th I was thinking he was trying to avoid that to some extent. Uh, and really, to, to some extent, I think he was uh, calling the bluff of the Spanish people to some extent and say, if this is really what you want, do you want a right-wing coalition in government? Then you have to go to a general election and back it up. So I think it's a gamble. It's a calculated mm -hmm. gamble, and obviously we won't know if it works or not until Monday. Indeed. Uh, Emily Schulteis, uh, let's speak to you in Berlin. You have an overview, really, of what's going on in Europe. I mean, calling snap elections is nothing new, is it, in any European capital, uh, least of all Spain? But what's at stake here is political survival, as well as, as massive issues such as the economy, the cost of living, fuel prices, immigration, and everything else in between. Right. This is this is a moment where you are seeing, you know, as you mentioned, this is about Pedro Sanchez's political survival. It is it is a referendum on his time in government and, and his governing coalition. And yet at the same time, this is a moment where we are seeing a lot of these these core issues that you mentioned um, manifesting in, in countries all across Europe. And so when we look at some of the broader trends toward shifts to the right that we've seen in a handful of countries over the last year, this is, it really fits within this sort of broader fabric of some of the, the things happening across the continent. Just your opinion, do you think he's taking a gamble? Sure, I think it's it's a it's a calculated gamble, as as uh, as Pablo and Jose Maria have mentioned. Uh, it's it is a chance to say, essentially, to call to call the electorate's bluff and say here is the, here is the alternative. The alternative is as we are seeing in, for example, Finland or Sweden or a handful of other countries across Europe. Here is the right wing alternative. Is that really what you want, or are we? going to sort of move forward and give him and his his coalition another option, another chance to uh, to continue in office. So, Jose, let me bring you back in in Madrid, because obviously, we you know, we're talking about options. We're talking about the, the right of politics, the left of politics. The right of politics here is about the Conservatives uh, and their allies who are leading in the polls at the moment. They did very well uh, in the May local and municipal elections. What do they offer? to the public in Spain that Sanchez's government doesn't offer right now? A yeah, very important um, factor in this election is the, re the rejection by the electorate of fragmentation and polarization. Um, if you see the polls, what we are going to see to witness most likely is a coming back to the two main parties. So by part bipartisanship, which was the um, you know the dominant trend in Spanish politics since the democratic transition throughout the 80s, 90s, and the beginning of the 2000s uh, was uh, overcome by the uh, uh, coming into um, in, into the uh, political scene of Podemos and and Vox to extremes. But now what we see is really the electorate coming back to the center, and I think that. Um, uh, the Partido Popular of Heijó is giving to the electorate this, this sense of moderation that is really very much um, looked for, looked by, by an important part of the electorate. So on the one hand, this is this rejection of extreme politics, which I think is positive. Uh, one should not um, deny the fact that uh, Sanchez has been governing with the strong support of Podemos, and that Podemos has really managed to get through most of its, I would say, radical politics. And, mm. you know, the Spanish public uh, at large wants just uh, feels at the center, wants to have, you know, more moderate politics. And I think this is what the Partido Popular of Feijó is giving to them now.
Pablo Calderon Martinez in London. What's really interesting about the politics of Spain right now is that every political party is saying, we want to win the election. They're talking like independent parties, yet the punters, the analysts, um, they are talking about the Conservative PP party and, and the Vox party playing chicken with each other. They're, they're trying to act like independents, but they know the final outcome is that they're going to have to work together uh, to oust Pedro Sanchez if that is the inevitable outcome. Are they just wasting time and, and saying, come on, let's just work together? Well, uh, I don't think it's necessarily wasting time. I don't think any uh, opposition leader could afford to say, like, well, we're not going to win the election, right, because then it disenfranchises its own votes, its own, its own base. So he has to say this. They both have to say that. I think on the left, the, the difference with the left is, of course, that they have been working together uh, uh, with Podemos uh, and now with Sumar. And, and obviously, it's a lot harder for Pedro Sanchez to come and say, like, no, of course, I would never govern with, with the far left parties or, or with Sumar, because they're already doing that. It's a lot easier to sort of call that bluff and to, to sort of posture if you've never done it before. So this is pretty much what the Partido Popular is, is trying to do and is playing to do. Uh, I don't necessarily agree that what we're seeing is a return to center politics. Uh, I think we're basically, in some ways, we haven't really moved forward in the last hundred years of, of Spanish history, in which we're seeing basically took very clearly the fine blocks to the left or to the right that are becoming amongst themselves even more politicized and more extreme. And I think that is, that is the danger here that we're seeing is, yes, the two main parties at the center are going to be getting, gaining the, the, the share of the vote, the largest share of the vote, whether the PP or the or the Socialist Party. Uh, but at the same time, it seems to me that they are becoming less and less able to have a conversation between them. Uh, and it seems that the extremes are coming back to dominate the discourse of Spanish politics. And I think that's very, very dangerous. Yeah, Emily, you were smiling through both of those answers. So I'd like to come back to you because you can analyse perhaps the, the left extreme and, and the extreme right when it comes to Spanish politics. I mean, uh, in terms of Spain's particular scenario, uh, how much of these extreme parties are going to play the kingmaker uh, if the election turns out the way we think it is, it's going to be a coalition, and the sport smaller parties uh, are the ones that are actually going to decide who might become prime minister. Right. I think that's the, the thing. And as you pointed out, there's the rhetoric that you hear up until the polls close, and then there's the rhetoric that you hear from these parties the day after, once the dust has settled and you know who has what percentage and which coalitions might be possible. And so, you know, I think for if we're speaking specifically about the right, you have this this dilemma of trying to make sure that you reassure your centrist voters that you are not on the extreme. And at the same time, if we want to talk about the impact of a party like Vox, of a, of a far-right party, then you've got the actual impact that they may end up having on governing if they end up in a governing coalition. But you also have the impact on the campaign rhetoric, on the political rhetoric, on the atmosphere. And I think both in Spain and in other countries across Europe, you see that these kinds of parties have an outsized impact on what topics are being discussed, how they're being discussed. And so if we look at the, the campaign period, at least, that is one area where you you can see that beyond someone's uh, votes in the polls, beyond how much, you know, what percentage they end up getting on Election Day, they are really being able to impact that debate and that discussion. Lots of little topics and discussions that we want to have about the issues. One of the issues is secessionism. Uh, Pablo, uh, sorry, uh, Jose back in uh, uh, Madrid, the current ruling coalition has worked with secessionist parties uh, to try and get um, government policy through parliament. We've seen that uh, by bringing the Catalan uh, politicians on board uh, and the Basques as well. What sort of effect... Has this sort of coalition agreement working together had on the psyche of the Spanish people when it comes to regional parties working within national government? Well, I, I would differentiate there between, you know, moderate regional parties and the extreme independentists. Um, and the problem with Sanchez, and I think this has really uh, affected him very negatively with the electorate, is that he has been um, supported in most of his main legislation by the extreme independentists. So we have uh, Bildu, which is, you know, the political uh, successor to, to the ETA terrorist group. And we have also on the Catalan side, Esquerra Republicana de Catalunya, which also comes from the extreme uh, Republican left. 
uh, working very closely with. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think this, this is really one of the points that is going to be quite decisive uh, in this election. Uh, even within his own party, the Socialist Party, there have been so many influential people and just, uh, you know, party, uh, party people, party folks who have been criticizing Sanchez uh, strongly on these decisions and the support that he has gotten from these extreme independentist groups. Uh, Pablo, let me just extend that question then, because you were nodding in agreement as well, I think, because obviously we saw that 2017 failed bid for independence in uh, the Catalan region. It saw perhaps Spain's most serious domestic crisis in years. And one does wonder how much of an effect that has had in the way that politicians speak about a united Spain and a Spain for everyone. Yeah, I think it's obviously the legacy of that very strong independentist movement in, in Catalonia is, is still being reverberating in Spanish politics today. And I agree with Jose Maria that probably the most relevant impact that we're seeing today is that it's very, it's relatively easy ammunition for the uh, for the Partido Popular and the parties to the right to criticize the socialist government and saying, there you go, this is a socialist government that is supported by these radical uh, secessionist movements. And it's clearly it's a, it's a party that does not protect the uh, the unification or the, the unity of Spain as, as one as an uh, indivisible. So I think that's the main issue that we're seeing here. But on the other hand, the socialist uh, government and the socialist party doesn't have any other alternative because at the end of the day, somebody has to govern, somebody has to run the country. And if the electorate keeps throwing very similar results with very similar size blocks, at the end of the day, somebody has to make decisions and somebody has to be uh, the prime minister. And if you need the support from the, uh, the secessionist parties or from whoever you need support, you're going to try to get it. And that's just the way politics works. Uh, the problem for the Partido Popular to a great extent is obviously they cannot uh, rely on the support from any of the regionalist parties because they will be in cooperation most likely and almost undoubtedly with Vox. So that means that the pool of candidates for creating a coalition from the right is a lot smaller than it would be from the left. But it, it all depends on the, the results the electoral decides to, to, to throw out, and, and we'll have to wait and see the calculations of the different parties. Indeed. Let's talk about messaging, uh, Emily, because Sanchez is criticised uh, for political alliances, as we've been talking about, the messaging of uh, management, uh, messaging and management, really, of, of feminist issues, transgender issues. But he's been praised on economy and the policies that he's laid bare after the pandemic. No politician can be one thing to all men and women. You have to choose your battles wisely, uh, and he does too, as do most politicians who are heading towards elections across Europe. Right, and I think, you know, we've been, as you mentioned, there was a global pandemic. We've had, uh, now Europe is is has been facing inflation, has been facing rise in energy prices due to the war in Ukraine. There are, there are a whole number of sort of global issues that are impacting not just one country, but um, but the continent and, and, in fact, large parts of the world as a whole. And so if you are a, an incumbent leader in these situations, and especially if, as we've talked about, this has very much become a referendum on on him and on his leadership and his, his tenure in office, then you need to be able to talk about why people should trust you to continue going and what you've done throughout these crises. And, you know, for that reason, some of the more sort of social culture war type issues are much less useful to him. What he needs to be doing is saying, I was the steady hand through these things. I might not have done everything perfectly, but but I can be the person to lead the country through further, you know, further crises or, or whatever, come what may, and and sort of the baseline functions, the, the economic issues, things like this, uh, are, are a, a huge core of what people are, are thinking about. Uh, Pablo uh, Calderón Martínez in London, uh, the left-wing parties that we've been talking about, like Unidas uh, Podemos, excuse my Spanish pronunciation, uh, and Sumar, uh, had sort of merged, as, as we've talked about and we found out. Um, but yet their popularity in that sort of merger, again, with Sanchez's party, hasn't been sort of realised properly, has it? Why have they lost that support? Um, I think, I don't know if they're lost support necessarily, but certainly sort of the support has merged and it hasn't really uh, moved forward as they would have liked. Uh, but I think a lot of this relies, and, and I agree with Emily to a great extent in the issue of messaging, I think a lot of this has to do with, and this I found this very surprising, I've always thought of Sanchez as a very good politician, particularly a very good campaigner. 
And I think a lot of the calculation of him calling this early general election uh, relied on his own experience as a campaigner, how he's always managed to sort of come from behind and surprise everybody. So I thought he was going to be able to repeat that trick. But, but I've been very surprised at how he has been unable to make the election about what he wants the election to be about, which is basically his economic record and, and his record sort of dealing with the crisis, the pandemic and the war in Ukraine and the cost of living crisis, which has been relatively successful in, in dealing with those crises. Instead, he's being dragged to these sort of culture wars, all these issues that are dominating immigration, transgender rights, feminism, and all these things that really uh, he doesn't really want to be talking about because what he wants to be talking about are his successes, particularly in the economy and, and, and showing leadership across the world. So I'm very surprised that basically Vox and the Partido Popular have been able to set the agenda of the, of the, yeah. of the election, and that's what we end up talking about. Um, Jose Benito in uh, Madrid. I mean, the share of the vote in the municipal elections, for example, the Conservatives, what, around 31%, Sanchez is socialist at 28 No other political party reached double figures. Uh, turnout is going to be very important on Sunday, especially when Europe is in the middle of a heat wave as well. I mean, how do you think this is all going to impact? Because, you know, you can't talk about elections without talking about one of the hottest issues, which is climate change. This was one of the most incredible, um, you know, things about the decision of uh, Pedro Sanchez to uh, call for elections at the end of July. I mean, you know what it is Spain at the end of July, of course, a holidays uh, country, and, and, and the heat wave is particularly strong at this very moment in, in, in most of the regions in Spain and also in Madrid. So that didn't make, to my eyes, much, much sense, except if you wanted to have uh, less mobilize the uh, voters on the right. But I don't think this is going to be, this strategy is going to be uh, successful. Um, it looks like 70% of the people are going to, to vote. Um, many, uh, or much more than in the past, have already voted uh, per mail. Um, and, you know, indeed, uh, it doesn't make much sense to, to call on a general election just, you know, after the municipal elections and in the middle of the start of the, of the holiday vacation for most of the time. It will be interesting to see what the turnout is. Pablo Martinez, let's just bring you in here, because horse trading is obviously something we've just talked about now. Do the public in, in Spain and your analysis of elections over the years, do you get the, the sense that people in Spain are bored with elections, are engaged with elections, are happy when elections happen. I mean, when you just look at 31% and 28% of the turnout for these two main parties, it's, it's what, just barely over 50% of the eligible electorate. Well, I think there's a difference. Interested and engaged and happy are different things. Happy, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, uh, because I think what we're seeing a lot is a, sort of a protest vote. But I think there's certainly a, a level of engagement, and I think, to, to a great extent, that is... Pablo Sanchez's, uh, uh, Pedro Sanchez's sorry, bet is to really to appeal to the sense of, uh, you know, feeling of, of the electorate and say we have to protect Spain against this, you know, this threat, this existential threat from the right and obviously with, with the legacy of the Franco dictatorship and everything that that's still, all the emotions that it stirs even today. Uh, so I, I agree with Jose Maria that that is why perhaps it's a little bit strange to be calling for an election in the middle of summer. Uh, during a heat wave, where perhaps it's not the best time to mobilize the electorate. But again, this will go down in history as either a horrendous miscalculation by a socialist government or, or a masterstroke by an uncanny political operator. And we will find out at the end of the election. Indeed. I mean, you just touched on another question I wanted to ask, and I, I'll go to uh, Jose in Madrid. It's about the, the, the effect of the Franco dictatorship years that have, has left on Spain and the, the stamp it's left on in terms of democracy and how uh, politics has developed in the country. Do people still have a tinge of understanding about, I don't know, that the Franco years, it does his influence still remain strong within the electorate and within the political sphere? I don't think that's the case. You know, the civil war started 90 years ago, nearly. Um, you know, the legacies, certainly for the, for the younger people, for the youth, and also for my generation and the generation that uh, went through the democratic transition 
to my eyes, is really not, not that strong. Another story is the political rhetoric that sometimes or even often is being used by the extremes. Uh, and again, here I would I would stress the fact that you know there is there is uh, on the one hand the extreme political rhetoric of the two groups uh, on the left and on the side, but they are just each of them you know around thirteen to fourteen percent. So so this is really not the mainstream of mm. the Spanish electorate. And I think to the mainstream of Spanish electorate, what people want, like everywhere in the world at this very moment, is more security, uh, more concern for the you know existential existential threats that, that they have been having uh, through the different crises. And and this is they want a government that really protects them, not governments that uh, go to the streams. I think this is okay. this is the feeling that I sense here. OK, we're coming very closely to the end of our programme. Emily Schultes, I just want to ask you in Berlin now, Str Spain is no stranger to political elections, as I said, and they actually have the last full EU presidency uh, before European elections uh, in 2024. How focused do you think other European capitals are going to be on Madrid over the weekend, considering that a shift to the left or to the right can sometimes influence politicians across the continent? Right. I think that as a result of that, there is a great deal of attention, you know, sitting in Brussels, European Union officials, but also in, in capitals across the continent, because, first of all, this could have, depending on how long a coalition negotiation takes, this could have impacts on the direction of the Spanish presidency over the course of the next uh, five and a half months. And so there's an immediate aspect to it there. But I think also... There is, because we see some of these political trends that are crossing borders, there is very much a sense that people are attuned to what's happening elsewhere across Europe as pretend, potentially a harbinger of what's to come for them. And when we have European elections on the horizon next spring, this is something that all countries are going to be grappling with coming, you know, in, in, the, in the coming months. And so there very much is a sense that this is, this is one data point potentially on the path towards those European elections. And there, I think, a poignant point to end our conversation. It's been a good uh, opportunity to talk to you all. And thank you very much for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. Jose Maria Benito in Madrid, Emily Schulteis in Berlin, thank and you. Pablo Calderon Martinez in London. Thank you for joining me on Inside Story. And thank you for watching as well. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sahil Rahman, and the entire Inside Story team, thanks very much for your time and your company.